so I'm here to give you a little bit of information around our new machine called Guardi. Um, but first of all, I wish to acknowledge the, uh, the Wadjuk Noongar people on whose land that we meet, uh, the ancestral owners. I acknowledge the First Australians as the traditional owners of uh, this land and I uh, pay my respects to uh, past elders and, and present. Um, what am I going to cover? A quick introduction to NCI, which you can probably skip through fairly quickly. Um, the tender challenge that has been to, to get the machine. A little bit about the new supercomputer. Some of the infrastructure challenges that we have. Uh, timelines and progress to date, where we're up to. And then lastly, um, a few things that will change for users going forward. So what are we? So NCI is the National Computational Infrastructure um, HPC Centre located in Canberra based on the ANU campus. Uh, we're actually a, a collaboration between ANU, CSIRO, Geoscience Australia and the Bureau of Meteorology as our foundational partners, uh, but then a lot of the major universities and research institutes plus industry. Um, our role is to try and provide a fully integrated computational environment for researchers doing nationally important stuff uh, for research and innovation. Um, a word from our sponsor, uh, the Department of Education, uh, under the ENCRIS program. So they pay uh, for our uh, capital expenditure. Uh, they were funded the original supercomputer that we currently have, Rigen, and uh, after much discussions and meeting with politicians and many, many papers later. Uh, as part of the, the National Roadmap in 2016, it was agreed that HPC was important and they should fund it. Um, in July of 2018, we finally got some money. Um, we got, received $70 million towards our new machine. Um, so what do we do at NCI? We provide high performance computing. We provide uh, cloud computing and data storage and services. Support the whole gamut of, uh, of research from the fundamental, strategic, applied, and through to some industrial research as well. Um, our big machine, what we run at the moment, Rigen, is Australia's fastest research supercomputer. It's around 89,000 cores. Uh, it has grown over time. It's a mismatch of uh, Sandy Bridge, uh, Broadwell and Skylake nodes at the moment. 128 um, GPUs, uh, which are a combination of NVIDIA, um, K80s and some P100s, 32 nodes. We have some KNLs, just to keep um, Doug happy. Um, we even have a couple of uh, power nodes as well from IBM, which we experimented with. Um, about 330 terabytes of memory across the entire system. Eight petabytes of scratch file space, uh, and we use a, a currently a hybrid FDR EDR uh, InfiniBand fabric from Mellanox, primarily uh, full fat tree FDR where we started from, and then when we added on the agility system, which you can see in the, the green flashy lights in the picture, uh, they were an EDR addition with the Broadwell nodes. HPC resources, as expected, our biggest. Um, Contributors are also our biggest users uh, in terms of allocation. Around 20% of the machine, so there's 19 there, is actually allocated to uh, the community, free of charge, a national merit allocation scheme. Uh, that goes out to the NCMAS, as it's called, with the Palsy Centre, uh, Flashlight and Massive. Um, but also we have some dedicated access to a number of um, centres of excellence as well. Uh, the researchers uh, come from a, a ragtag collection of anything and everything that uses HPC. Um, primarily, when we first started, there was a, a very strong focus on climate and weather, but that's actually grown and, uh, and changed slightly. It's important to understand why, because we actually have a, a very large user group, um, a broad range, brand, broad range of users, uh, we have a sort of a very eclectic user base. Um, and so that becomes important a little bit later um, in terms of actually deciding what sort of new machine we're going to get. Um, what we're trying to replace as part of our uh, tender process 
was Rajan, the original Rajan R1, uh, commissioned in October uh, 2012, which means it's going to approach uh, seven years old uh, this year. Uh, 57,000 uh, 57, Sandy Bridge cores, 160 terabytes of main memory, and it was named after the Shinto god of thunder and lightning uh, because it was a climate and weather thing. Uh, around 1.2 petaflops um, when it was originally benchmarked. The challenge we have in terms of trying to replace it is actually trying to find the right sort of machine. So we have uh, researchers who are power users. Uh, we have the researcher that just does a little bit of HPC on Sundays. Um, and also all the beginners and the users that are PhD students. So we went out and asked them, what sort of machine do you need? Well, it needs to be fast. If I get the right clicky. Yep. It also needs to be robust. Um, so you've got to have that as well. There's a slight delay here. I'm pushing the wrong button, that's why. Um, it's got to have a big engine, got to go. Um, but it also needs to be economical. So it's like trying to buy a car for a committee for people. Um, it needs to have lots of storage uh, because everyone needs more storage. <laughs> um, you need good after sale support. And, and uh, you need to buy it off the plan. So the other tricky thing with any HPC system, because of the length of time it takes to go through the procurement, you're often buying and trying to assess systems that may or may not exist. So I could make a comment about vendors and selling vaporware, but um, <laughs> just let's say that uh, sometimes you have to sort of take a leap of faith with some of the things that they're proposing. Um, and that can be quite tricky, uh, trying to validate benchmarking, as we've heard. Um, against different types of different users. Um, oh, and also it has to be within budget. Um, so a bit of a, a tricky challenge. After a very long drawn out process, um, we ended up with a number of bids. All of them were uh, very competitive. Um, in fact, any of them actually would have been a good machine. Um, in the final process, it was extremely difficult to, uh, to differentiate them. In the end, uh, Fujitsu Australia was selected as the prime contractor. Fujitsu proposed a compute solution using Lenovo liquid cooled uh, systems, a warm water direct liquid cooled, uh, using the Cascade Lake 8274 Intel CPUs. They've proposed their own Fujitsu liquid cooled GPU systems using the V100s as Gabrielle mentioned yesterday. Um, large memory nodes, which will be experimenting with the, the new Optane memory from Intel as part of those. Um, NetApp storage uh, for our Lustre file systems, DDN Lustre, and a Mellanox HDR fabric in a Dragonfly Plus topology, along with Altair PBS Pro for the scheduling. Oh, I missed a slide. That's right. Um, so, did it? Yeah. I had a macrame picture that must be in there somewhere later. Um, Gardi, uh, pronounced Gardi or Gardi, um, not Gaddy. Uh, Gardi is actually a Nunnawal word meaning to search for. So, Nunnawal is actually the indigenous. Um, peoples that are in the, the northern part of Canberra, and Canberra just touches the base of the, their traditional lands. This year is also the Indigenous, um, being acknowledged by the United Nations as the Indigenous Year of uh, Indigenous Languages, sorry. Um, and it aims to raise, raise awareness of those languages and culture. So we thought it was quite an appropriate. It was about time that Australia actually had an Australian machine named uh, appropriately. Um, a brief overview of the system looks fairly straightforward. We have data login nodes, uh, data mover nodes. Uh, we have a number of data analysis nodes. So this is an attempt where we're actually putting in some GPUs at the front end 
to do some of that pre or post analysis. The high performance fabric, the compute nodes, which we've talked about, uh, GPU nodes, uh, our high performance nodes, and we have a number of file systems associated with the solution. So a scratch file system, which gets us around one terabyte um, per second, uh, but we're looking at running that probably as two separate uh, scratch file systems, which gives us just over 100 or 500 gigabytes per second for robustness. We're also going to deploy an IO intensive file system with NVMe, uh, a system for all the modules and the home directories. Um, so as part of our home directories going forward, those home directories will be shared between our, our HPC environment and also our dedicated cloud environments as well, just to try and make things easier for users. Um, specifications, so as I previously mentioned, uh, Intel Cascade Lake, 8274 processors, 3,000 plus nodes. The exact number is, will be flexible. Uh, it'll be slightly greater than that. It depends on the final pricing. Uh, each node will be uh, two processors, 24 cores each, 192 gig of RAM because of the six memory channels. And that'll give us greater than 140,000 cores. Uh, the NVIDIA GPUs, 160 nodes there, each with four GPUs in each node, giving us a total of 640 GPUs of the V100s, and some large memory nodes of around 1.9 uh, terabytes of RAM, of which 1.5 is the new Optane memory. Uh, Mellanox, as I mentioned, InfiniBand, Dragonfly topology, with islands of uh, 40,000 cores. And our plan is to run CentOS 8 across the system. Uh, this is the Macrami picture that I was talking about before. So I think Ashroot drew this, maybe. <laughs> um, the whole idea of the Dragonfly topology is to reduce the, the number of switches that we have. So each of the sort of black bits are what known as an island, effectively a, a full fat tree topology, around 40,000 cores uh, in there, and then uh, are less well connected between the islands. Um, but for most jobs, that will be fine. So, great, it's really good. We've now got a system that meets our wish list, something that was fast, uh, powerful, robust, energy efficient, loads of storage, on-site support, and even within budget. Um, now we just have to install it. So. I've killed the machine. There you go, wrong one. Um, luckily, we had a bit of space left over in our data center. After much cleaning, uh, we removed, and we have some empty space. This is when some of our challenges started. So, um, one of our first challenges is that we have to keep Rygen running while we're actually getting the new machine operational. So, we need a bit more power. Um, warm water cooling implies that you need some water. Um, and in this part of the data center, there was no water. So we need additional pipe work, uh, additional cooling towers, new heat exchangers, and that, in fact, because of the limited space, means we actually have to replace one of our cooling towers with a, a larger cooling tower. Um, it's heavy. So one of the things that um, Werner mentioned yesterday, one of these direct liquid cools, there's just more metal inside the machine. So we're now approaching two tonnes per square metre. Um, uh, individual rack is around 1,400, or 13, yeah, 1,300 kilograms, uh, which is 600 wide by 1,200 deep. So it's quite a, a hefty weight in a small space. Um, lots of copper. Great for resale, I'm sure. Um, lots of equipment is coming in, and of course that has its own challenges. So not only lots of equipment for the data center, but also coming in. So there's packaging you've got to get rid of, storage space, and coordinating deliveries. So this morning we had an issue with people with pipes trying to deliver at the same time as people with disks. Um, one of the many things. Um, because of all the building works, it's been deemed a major project. And of course, that means lots of project managers. Lots of coordination. At last count, I think there were 10 plus project managers 
from each of the different organisations. I'm now convinced that if you put two people into a room, after a little while, one of them will morph into a project manager. Um, <laughs> it's just incredible. Anyway, uh, engineers and install teams are all there. So, uh, a large selection. Timelines. So, when, did the, when was it supposed to be delivered? When was it going to be there? Well, back in 2016, when we first started this journey, um, the expectation was that it would be done in 2017 and would be up and, and running. Ideally, it was supposed to be at the start of 2016, had our original plans gone to, to play. Um, in the end, um, after we'd gone through the tender process, we were originally scheduled for Q3 in 2012, uh, 2019. Uh, but due to delays in signing contracts with various lawyers and changing uh, conditions, um, we're about three months behind where we would like to have been. Um, so our current target for production for phase one, because I've got to keep both Rigen running and the new system, so phase one of Guardi, which will be about 17 racks, give me, gives me about the same number of cores as what the Sandy Bridge system does, um, is targeted for October, possibly really late October, maybe Halloween, um, but the aim is for October anyway. Um, and of course then we have got to look at the transition of users off Rigen onto the new machine. Uh, because of our delays, we're going to be fairly pressed and we're actually looking at how we can actually compress that transition time. As part of it, we've already looked at the uh, installation of the storage, so getting the storage in early so users can start moving anything from the scratch file system uh, called slash short uh, that they should really only use for temporary basis, but they never do. Um, making that available earlier on to assist with the transition. We're also investigating singularity, and one of the things that we're looking at is actually to create uh, a Rigen environment in Singularity that will sit on the new machine. This way I can turn off the old machine and people hopefully won't see too much of a difference. So it's a work in progress and it looks pretty promising. Um, that may mean that we can s squeeze our transition time um, even less to a few days. Um, originally my decommissioning date was the 4th of November uh, for Rigen that may be blown out a little bit. Uh, the idea is to have the complete installation done and dusted by the 1st of January 2020. Um, just insert standard vendor disclaimer, lots of small print here. Um, all dates are subject to change. Uh, progress to date. Our media crew have been onto it. They're now doing a, a, a daily or semi-daily blog of things that are happening inside the data hall. Uh, there's a bit.ly link, just a little bit easier than, than yours, Cindy, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, so what has been the progress to date? Well, one of the first things is we have to change where the lights sat inside the data center because a different configuration, so the lights had to be moved. Um, because it's heavier, we had to replace the floor. So we've pulled up the floor in that part of the data centre. Um, and just as we're in the, about to start doing things, I got this phone call at 10.30 at night saying, there's no power. Um, it happens that one of our transformers um, sprung a leak. And you can see on the, the left-hand side, a fair amount of oil in plastic drums. That's what they had to siphon off one of the transformers. Uh, and then we had the transformer replaced. So a little bit of a challenge, um, not caused by any of the works, just a coincidence. Um, up went a wall, so we now have a wall that separates the, the construction site from the rest of the data centre. Um, mostly impervious to dust, mostly. Um, and of course then we've had to install new cable trays for the networking and a whole stack of cable trays under the floor. Uh, for the electrical works. So that's a, supposed to be a, a fisheye type picture of what's happening in that space. Uh, we had to leave a little bit of the old floor 
because of one of the distribution boards that were still there. Uh, when I left on Monday to come here, they were rolling out big drums of copper wire to start rolling those and populating those cable trays. Meanwhile, in a small place called Quimbian, just outside Canberra, uh, one of the local workshops was starting to weld up the copper piping, piping that was required for the cooling solutions. Uh, it's very important to make sure that you know what metals are being used, given that we're going to have direct liquid cooling that will be flowing through the machines. And so water quality is one of the things that we have to monitor and also the type of chemicals that go in and biofouling units that go in there. But anyway, the welding's all done and these were the pipes that were on the floor this morning um, causing a bit of an issue. Meanwhile, at the other end of our data centre, the bit that wasn't being revamped, um, we had space uh, for our storage systems. So we installed a whole stack of new APC racks, more in-row coolers of 300 mil wide, um, and a whole stack of arrays from, from NetApp, and boxes and boxes of disk. Um, the arrays arrived empty, so they have to be filled manually. So 8,012 disks have now been installed on site by little people. Um, and now we're just waiting for the, uh, the service to turn up as part of our Lustre file system. Meanwhile, um, last week I had the privilege of going to, to Hungary um, and uh, into a little place called Shava or Sava. Apologies to any Hungarian speakers. Um, and this is where Lenovo is actually doing the assembly uh, in a flex factory of the components. So this is actually one of our units being constructed, uh, assembled on the floor. On the little insert there, you can see the, the blue is the, the cool water that goes in into the solution. There are actually two nodes into a blade type arrangement. Uh, it goes through uh, the one lot of dims, through the CPUs, and then back out the other side of dims, joins together, and then out through a single um, manifold. So unfortunately, when we lose one node, we actually have to take two nodes offline now to do the repair work. Um, within the factory, they actually build the service and they also do the construction of the racks themselves. Put them together, wheel them around as a complete rack unit, validate that all the, the nodes in the rack work. Uh, if they don't, they swap out the entire node until they've done all the testing. Uh, they then pressurise the entire system with uh, nitrogen to make sure it's uh, watertight. Then they fill it with water into a clean room, run it for two days, you're doing HPL, empty it out, fill it with nitrogen again to wash out the water, and then package it up. So uh, they ship the entire rack uh, ready to go. There's one already boxed up. Um, some retrobates that are there with uh, the first lot of shipments ready to go. Um, I'm sure it's a fisheye lens because I look fat in that, so <laughs> must be the angle. Um, a couple of changes for the users that we're seeing that will go forward. Uh, because we're using Intel, we're going from Intel, uh, there'll be binary compatibility, so that should be straightforward. But obviously for people to get the best performance out of this, the system, Obviously, recompiling is the way to go. Um, the latest version of third-party software apps will be installed. So basically, we're encouraging users to move to the latest version now so that we don't have to port all the applications across. We're going to stick to the, the new versions. Uh, older versions will be deprecated. Um, Guardi Scratch versus Ryogen Short. So this is the, the temporary file space. Uh, as part of closer alignment with uh, our friends at Pawsey, uh, we've agreed that we'll call our temporary file space Scratch. Yes, yes that's one for you guys. <laughs> um, and so from a user perspective, uh, it'll mean uh, it'll be easier longer term that they can then transfer from one um, site to the other. Um, and to also to be consistent, we're looking at file purging policies on the Scratch. Um, which will come as a shock to some people, uh, but we'll 
I'm sure there'll be an exception. Um, also, we're going to ask users to actually request all the file systems they require. So as part of a, a security um, push and also to improve uh, the user experience, uh, by people asking for each of the file systems they require, only those file systems will be mounted um, and they will only have access to those file systems. That means if you request a file system and that file system was unavailable, one of our global data file systems perhaps, then we can hold your jobs because we know that your job is dependent on something. Um, it also means that uh, because only your uh, directories are being mounted, you don't get to see anybody else's, and if somebody's made a mistake with their permissions, um, it helps. Um, we're also looking at encouraging users to update their passwords, and next year we'll probably go two-factor authentication as part of things going forward. So, if you'd like to come and see the new machine when it's installed um, next year, HPC AI Advisory Council 2020 will be in Canberra. Um, that's what I've been told. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as part of that, you're more than welcome to come along. We'll do a tour of the new machine and uh, have a look. The dates and exact locations, obviously, to be confirmed. Um, no doubt there'll be new details coming out when that happens. So, any questions? Yep. Um, you can't look, you can look, at the, you can look at the disks that were there, but you can't actually look at the, uh, the construction site because it's a construction site, you need a white card and asbestos training or something to go into it. Um, but yeah, so soon, um, hopefully, we'll actually have the pipes in the ground. Well, Sitting there. Yep. Can you have a diagram show? Is that just logical? Does it show the things that. Yeah, it was just logical. Um, and it doesn't really reflect reality either because um, whether it's actually exactly four balanced nodes, whether it'll be five islands or whatever. Roughly 40,000 cores. Roughly 40,000 cores in an island. Um, and that it, again will be subject to change in terms of how we actually do the topology. So we're going to have Legacy Island, um, just like Fantasy Island, so the people who, who, who can't be, accept reality and move on, they want to keep using the old things, the old systems. So our Broadwell nodes and our, our current Sky Lakes will, and our current GPUs will probably sit inside that um, Legacy Island. Again, to assist with the transition and to try and speed it up. Um, well, we've actually got cameras up there in, so that people can actually take a look inside. Uh, when the room was originally designed, there was no viewing portal, unlike Pawsey, where you can look down and see a, a vast expanse of machines. Um, we have to traipse people upstairs and downstairs and to go through and have a look at anything. Quite a noisy environment. <coughs> anything else? Any other questions? Time for beer and the bus. <laughs> Thank you.